Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Karina, and I'm an alcoholic. I have to share this with you. My Last night when we checked in, my husband saw this ribbon, and he goes, Congratulations, your cow won second prize. <laughs> He's not in the program, but he sure keeps my ego in check, let me tell you. It really is an honor to be asked to do this. I was asked like a year and a half ago to come. I'm like, oh, sure, so far away. I didn't think about it and, you know, get closer and closer. But, um, you know, it's strange. People have been asking me if I was nervous. I was talking to Tracy before the meeting. I said, I'm just going to show up. And if it's not a good talk, it's God's fault, not mine. Because <laughs> it's just, you know. So I only have one story, so how bad can I screw it up, you know? Um, my sobriety date is October 24th, 1987, and um, I was 23 years old when I got sober. I guess that's why I'm a young people. Um, anyway, I, um, I started uh, drinking and using things to change the way I felt from a really early age. Probably about 11 when it was a regular thing. You know, and, and it really solved a lot of problems for me. I always felt, I always felt like I, did, you know, I didn't fit in. And I hear that a lot in alcohol synonymous. Um, I looked like I fit in and I did, you know, I could throw a good laugh and I could always, you know, look at you, size you up try to be like you and, you know, try to fit in, but and it always felt uncomfortable, and um, drinking took that away, and I was always looking outside of myself to make everything okay, you know, that if only, you know, if only I got a college degree, or if only I had the right boyfriend, or the right husband, or the right something outside of myself, then I would be okay. There was always one more thing to attain before I was going to be okay. And, um, you know, I, I did all that. I, I was, you know, like a lot of alcoholics that, you know, I was an honor student. I was able to ex- excel at a lot of things. You know, we're smart people. And um, I don't think that my drinking really became a problem for me until after I graduated from college. I um, was only 20 years old, and um, I turned 21 a month later. And I was had my degree in nursing, and I couldn't take state boards for, you know, six months or four months or something like that. And um, I, when I turned 21, I decided I was tired of being a nursing assistant and helping people get cleaned up after they went in the bed. And then I wanted to be um, – I decided to be a cocktail waitress for the summer. <laughs> That was a fun job. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I met my first husband there. He was a bartender and a Coke dealer. Match made in heaven. Was that, as Jim says, no one on earth would have done it. Um, but I got married six months later to my drinking buddy. I was 21 years old. And I had my nursing license for all of a month, I think, at the time. And, uh, see, I forgot to tell him that, you know, when we got married, we were going to be responsible, get a house, you know, be Ozzie and Harriet. You know, he had other plans, and I didn't give him the script. And so, needless to say, it really wasn't working out very well. Um, We had a good honeymoon, and when we got back, you know, it was just a struggle. It was just a struggle. I tried for about a year to control and enjoy his drinking (laughs) and control and enjoy my drinking. And if you're an alcoholic, you can either control it or enjoy it, but they don't go together. So then, see, if I only, if only I got rid of him, then I'd be fine. So I did. I took my cat and my car and my clothes, and I went and got an apartment and everything was going to be okay. 
Well, needless to say, you know, I wound up going on binges. I was a periodic. I didn't drink all the time. I wasn't a maintenance drinker. But when I drank, who knew what was going to happen, you know? It was possible for me to go out and have a glass of wine with dinner and go home and, and you know, that was it. It was also possible that I'd go out to dinner and have a glass of wine and wake up four days later, you know, from a blackout. I never knew what was going to happen to me when I started to drink. And I think that's what why I, it was hard for me to believe that I was an alcoholic because, you know, alcoholics, every time you drink, there's problems, right? You get arrested, drunk driving, this and that. It didn't happen to me. I um, didn't lose everything. I had an apartment that had um, a bed and a desk and dishes. I didn't have a couch or a table or anything like that because I had better things to spend my money on. And, um, you know, I just I just kept doing the deal and trying to, you know, control and enjoy my drinking. And I thought if I got rid of my ex-husband, then I'd be fine. Well, a couple months later, I came to Buck Naked on my living room floor, surrounded by all my furniture. And, um... Just spiritually bankrupt, just wanting to die, just, you know, I mean, I had a job, and I had a car, and I had stuff, and I was just miserable. I was just miserable. I was, I knew there was something just terribly wrong with me, and that the world would just be better off if I was dead. And um, although I'm not courageous enough to be suicidal, I prayed that God would let me die. And I probably said something like, God, help me. I don't really remember. But that day I called my dad, and at the time he hadn't drank in 13 years, and he was the only one I knew who had ever gotten sober. So I called him, and he came over, and he took me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that night. And it was uh, at the Saturday Night Live group in Campbell, California, on a Saturday night. And I sat there and cried the whole time. And my father got up and shared, and I was mortified. <laughs> Pointed at me and said, she needs phone numbers. And, like, 5,000 women came up to me after the meeting. And I got phone numbers that I never used. And, um, but it was a really good introduction. I kept going to meetings, you know. I still had a lot of yeah buts. A lot of yeah buts. See, I know this is Alcoholics Anonymous. This is my story. I came in here as a cocaine addict. I didn't have a problem with alcohol. My problem was drugs. And I was different. I was terminally unique. Um, but I was so desperate, I didn't have anywhere else to go. And I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a creature of habit. Okay, I knew where that meeting was. That was the only meeting I went to for like a year and a half. Three, four times a day, I'd go there, but I didn't go anywhere else because I knew where that one was, and that's where I went, and I made my little um, nest, and I stayed in it. And uh, anyway, I kept going to meetings, and then someone gave me a big book, and I started reading it, and I wasn't using, but I was still drinking and because I didn't have a problem with alcohol until I read the big book. (laughs) You know, I started reading that thing, and the lights started going on, and I started identifying with with parts of the book. And and I just, one day, I don't even remember really if I drank or I didn't this last time, but I do remember I I poured myself a glass of wine, and I sat down at my dining room table, and I was going to drink it. I don't know if I drank it or not. I don't remember. But I had this, like, moment of clarity. It was kind of like getting hit in the head with a baseball bat. And it said, who am I kidding? You know, I I am one. And so I poured the I poured the wine out, and I went to a meeting. And I, that was October 23rd, 1987. And I haven't had to take a drink since. And um, <laughs> let me tell you, only by the grace of God, because I have trudged through some stuff. Okay. Um, <laughs> I remember just a few years ago when I was in one of my dark places, sitting on the floor while my daughter was playing, and 
And I was like, God, why can't I just have a glass of wine like those other people take the edge off, you know, kind of thing. And then the next thought, God just, he just blesses me like this. Because <laughs> no, people who can don't want it as bad as you do. That was, <laughs> that was the next thought. <laughs> it's like, you know, when it, because I have experienced that when, when no human power can save me from the next drink. You know, it's because of the stuff, the work that I've done in Alcohol Sonomous that God has been able to pull me by the shirt collar, you know, out of that thinking when I've gotten there. Um, my first few uh, few months in Alcohol Sonomous, like I said, I came, I came here in July. I got sober in October. I am so blessed. I see people struggle for a lot longer than that. I mean, God was very gracious with me. And I got a sponsor, and I started working the steps right away. Because, see, I had been going to meetings, and I heard people talking about, you know, they would do one, two, three, and go out, one, two, three, and go out. Or they wanted to, they did, there were steps they didn't want to go to, you know, do. And I remember um, in going to a day of sobriety, and this guy shared, uh, like a unity day kind of thing. And this guy shared about one, of, he is, there's 12 steps, like there was 12 disciples. And one of those steps is the Judas step. And it doesn't matter what number it is. It matters that's the one you think you don't have to do. And I remember, I mean, there's just these things as, you know, these nuggets that God gave me during that time. So I knew the steps were important. And I knew, also heard someone else say, nowhere in the big book does it say, and now we take a break. <laughs> I just love, I mean, drunks have the best humor, huh? So I'm like, that's cool. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to steal that one. So, um, so I got a sponsor and I started to work the steps and, um, in order with her. And I remember moving my first, uh, I don't know, it was like four weeks sober or something like that. I don't know, eight weeks sober. And I, I had to move. And um, I remember asking my sponsor, I was getting ready to write my eighth step list, and I'm like, okay, can I unpack my bathroom first and then write the eighth step list? Or, you know, I, I was so afraid that I was, I was going to be somehow um, resting on my laurels, you know, if I put anything ahead of the steps. And she used to laugh at me and pat me on the head and say, yes, you can unpack your bathroom. It's good to be clean. And then write your steps, you know. <laughs> so... But, though, you know, I really, I was so desperate to stay here that in the beginning I took, I took, I didn't trust my thinking at all. I checked everything with my sponsor, everything. And uh, last night I was sitting next to a gentleman who's got 71 days and he's at his first conference and I was like, you are so lucky, you know. I was, I think I had about 80 days, 85 days when I went to my first conference and it was an NCCAA conference. It was in San Jose and it was just awesome. I think it's, if you can experience something like this, new in sobriety, you know, I think it has, goes a long way to keeping you here because there's some magic that happens in these rooms. There really is. Um. So anyway, back to the steps. I um I didn't find doing the steps all that hard because I I was so desperate, you know. The first step was obvious. The second step was interesting because I had always I'd been raised in several different churches. My mother couldn't make up her mind and um and uh I got here with this concept that I had to get my act together and then I could go make things right with God. It never occurred to me to go to him first to get my act together. I was like embarrassed or I, I don't really, I don't know, don't know if I've ever really labeled that thing, but it was like I just had it all backwards. And it was really freeing to find out that, you know what? <laughs> If I give this to God, he'll take care of it, you know. And I remember um, learning that I didn't know how to let go of anything. That the only way that I let go of something is to pick something else up. I had some incredible teachers in my early sobriety. You know, I heard this story about, you know, this little girl, she, her doll broke and she wanted her mommy to fix it. She's like, mommy, mommy, fix my doll. And she goes, okay, give it to me. No! And 
I have a little girl like that. <laughs> and I was that little girl, you know. And it's not unless I can give my stuff to my father, my heavenly father, is he able to fix it. And so he gives me some other toy to play with. And, you know, in the beginning it was men. You know, my first three years of sobriety, I had a series of really sick relationships because I was there. And, um... <laughs> But I stayed in the steps, and I stayed in meetings, and I stayed in service, and I did all the stuff, you know. And, you know, I hear people advise newcomers, you know, don't get in a relationship in the first year and all that kind of stuff. I have no opinion on that. I figure, you know what, do what you got to do. Nothing drove me faster to the steps than a guy. (laughs) You know, God will use what God will use. You know, he works in mysterious ways. So... I have no opinion on that. It's an outside issue as far as I'm concerned. Um, And then when I finally was able to see that, you know, come to believe that God could restore me to sanity, that I didn't have to do it first, that was really cool. And then I got kind of stuck on the third step. And I had a teacher that taught me. She said, you know, the third step, you don't turn your will and your life over to the care of God. It's a decision. It's a commitment to continue the steps. Because not until you have written an inventory, shared it with someone else, you know, able to see the exact nature of your wrongs, make a list, make amends, you know, humbly ask him to remove your shortcomings. Not until you do all of that stuff, it's in the process of that that you turn your will and your life over to the care of God. And I'm like, oh, wow, that is so cool. I can do that. I can make a commitment to keep going. So that's what I did. I got on my knees with her, and I did the third step prayer. And I knew that God wasn't going to strike me wonderful that day. And Because I, I had a lot of questions. I heard a lot of people talking about doing the first three steps and then getting loaded. So they were afraid of the inventory or something. So then I, when I realized this, I'm like, you know what? They didn't do the third step then because they didn't make the commitment. So they did one, two and went out. So I got all, you know my my uh, 90 day wonder attitude came out you know <laughs> kind of judgmental and stuff whatever I'm sober um, so I um, <laughs> so I did an inventory and you know what more will be revealed I did the very best I knew how at the time to do an inventory And it worked. I got to stay sober. And boy, have I had inventories to do since then. So if you're afraid you're not going to do a thorough enough inventory, it doesn't matter. Just do it. Just start. Make the commitment and keep moving forward. Um, The only thing that we have to do perfect is not pick up the first drink. You know, this is step one. And if you stay here long enough, you'll have plenty of opportunities to do more inventories. So trust me. Um, and then sharing it with my sponsor, you know, um, I've heard a lot of things about a lot of things about sponsorship too um, in my years around here, and I I suggest that you have one. Um, you know, switching sponsors is okay. You know, I've had to do it a couple of times in sobriety, but it's really good to have one person that knows all of your stuff, rather than a little, you know, have a little little. Partial sponsor here and a partial, you know, you can still shoot angles and manipulate and do all that kind of stuff. And, you know, for this alcoholic, that's death. I have to have one person that can jerk my covers when I need it and knows me inside and out. And I have a wonderful sponsor. I've had really, really good um, teachers in this program. At least I feel I have. So, I just lost track of where I was. Oh, good stuff. Okay. <laughs> then, uh, six and seven, the first time I did them, were really kind of, um, kind of wrote. It just kind of, I just did it. Didn't really thoroughly understand what I was doing, but I was just taking the next step. I looked to see, you know, how had I done, built a good foundation so far. I did the seven step prayer with my sponsor, and I wrote my eight step list after I unpacked my bathroom. And then, and then I started about making amends. And uh, some some of them were letters I had to write. Some of them were face to face. Some of them were purely my ego and got crossed off. 
the list because they weren't really me causing harm. It was me thinking I was important. Um, that's why it's really important to deal with a sponsor because they can give you that direction. And then my favorite amends are living amends. Um, you know, like, I spent a lot of years just trying to get stuff from my, from my brothers and stuff, doing things, you know, try to just, I only called them when I needed something, that kind of thing. And so I started practicing, you know, just calling to say hi. They couldn't figure it out. They were really perplexed. But what do you want? Nothing. I just, what's going on? You're weird. So, um, but just that kind of stuff, you know, um, showing up at work and really earning what they were paying me, you know, um, that was probably the hardest thing was taking, taking the principles to work. That was probably the hardest thing for me to do. And that took a couple of years probably before I was really able to do it. Cause I, you know, I thought that they were really lucky I showed up and they were blessed to have me. They were underpaying me, and, you know, I mean, I just had a terrible attitude about work for a long time. Um, so then I lived happily ever after. No. Um, <clears throat> when I was four years sober, I um, met a man in this program, and uh, we got married and had two little girls. And um, he had trouble staying sober. He uh, got addicted to prescription medication. And then um, when that was cut off, he started to drink and use street drugs and stuff. And I spent about three years trying to get him sober. And uh, I can't do that. I wrote this. It was funny. I did. I did uh, inventories. She took one through nine. As always, whenever, ever, ever, I am blocking me from the sunlight of the spirit. It's the process of one through nine that clears it away and gets me back on the path with God. Who I kept coming up with the same answer, but I didn't like it, so I do the steps again. <laughs> I was really, really committed to keeping my family together. And then when I realized that that it was probably going to kill my ex-husband and it was going to really destroy my kids, that I had to end that marriage. And it was very painful for me, you know, because um, when I said, till death do us part, I, I meant it. Um, and it was not easy for me to get to that decision. And uh, But today he's sober. Almost two and a half years, and I am very, very proud of him. You know, thank God that, thank God that he gave me the wisdom to do, to do that. Because I think if I would have stayed married to him, he'd probably be dead today. And he's a really good daddy, and uh, he's he's doing a good job. And thanks to you guys, I remember standing in a meeting in Los Gatos, going, you know what, you guys, you guys got to take care of him because I'm going to kill him. My love will kill him. And uh, anyway, that was that was it was during that period there where I had that thing about watching my daughter play and, and wanting a glass of wine and getting that people who don't people who uh, can don't want it as bad as you do. I just that I can still hear that clear as a bell. And I remember there were certain little things that I hung on to through that time. It was a very dark time in my life, and uh, it was the the women, my very best girlfriend Shirley and and Janine and Michelle and uh, uh, people that went to my home group at the time, which was the Free to Be Me closed women's meeting at Church of the Times in San Jose. In my heart, that's still my home group. <laughs> anyway, um, I would go there and and. It had baby, we had babysitting, so I could bring my kids. It didn't matter what my psycho husband was doing. I could take my kids, you know, and go to a meeting at least every Thursday night if I couldn't get anywhere else. And, and I just remember, you know, doing the Lord's Prayer. And one night it hit me when we were doing the Lord's Prayer that it's my daily bread. You know, give us our daily bread. 
He doesn't give me weekly bread. As much as I'd like it, you know, I just get what I need today. And, uh, you know, this program has blessed me so much. I mean, there were times during that, that period of time where I was this close to homeless. I had a job, but I was paying $1,000 a month for child care, and I had bills, and I had, you know, I mean, I was I was crazy. And, uh, you know, God just sent angels everywhere. I'd get, you know, gift certificates in the mail for Lucky's or Safeway, you know, around the holidays, and the people knew that, you know, I needed to feed my kids. And I'd get care packages left on my front step, and then my church paid tuition for my kids for uh, eight months for child care. They gave me full full tuition for their their daycare. And God just totally carried me through that time. And Alcoholics Anonymous is awesome. I have never had to walk through anything alone here in the 14 years that I've been here. I've had to go through some stuff that was really uncomfortable or really scary or really new. And I've always, always had a woman to hold my hand through it. That had either, you know, been there before, walked the path before me, or was just willing to hang out and ride the waves with me, you know. And um, I never had that before I got to Alcohol Synonymous. I never had that in my family. I still don't have that in my family. That's all another subject. Um, I'm married again to someone who's not in the program. There's only room for one alcoholic in our house. Um, I remarried two years ago to a wonderful man. Wonderful, wonderful man. He's a great stepdad. Like I said, he keeps my ego in check. He's fun. He's here with me this weekend, but he's not in the room because he doesn't need to hear my story. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I moved away. Uh, I, I got sober in San Jose, and I I lived there for a long time. And, and then I moved to Tracy for a couple of years and, and moved back to San Jose. And about a year and a half ago, I moved up to Kelseyville. Now, everybody knows where that is. You know, it's, it's a little town on Clear Lake, about two hours north of Napa. And I live on the side of Mount Canocti with a beautiful view. I have a nice home. Little, my girls go to a fabulous school. I have the best job I've ever had. I do uh, community nursing. I do home home nursing. And I have the most flexible schedule. If I have to go to a parent-teacher conference, I just schedule my patients around it. And uh, I have a fabulous boss. I, um, I'm really, I have, what do you call it, countless opportunities to serve God in my job, you know. Um, it's not only in Alcoholics Anonymous that I get to serve God. And, and you know, when I was first sober, I used to think that. You know, like I said, I had a hard time taking my my the, the principles of this program to work or, you know, to my family or whatever. And now it's just, you know, okay, I guess because I've practiced it for a long time, it's kind of second nature for me. And the rewards that I reap in return for practicing these principles in all my affairs are tremendous. You know, and I don't do it all the time. I still get that, you know, New Yorker street attitude, like, you know, you people are sitting around trying to piss me off, you know. But um, it doesn't happen that often anymore. And the only difference between, you know, me and somebody with a week of sobriety is that I've practiced doing this longer, you know. You know, I, I'm stumbling over my words a lot today, and I don't care. <laughs> I um, I was listening to Paul this morning, and he was saying, you know, he's, he was nervous because he felt like, you know, he wanted everybody to like him, and he had to say the right stuff and, and that kind of thing. And, and I thought, you know, wow. I, I'm not. I, I'm just not there today, and I know that I have been a million times, but just today, I'm just not there. And and you know, Alcoholics Anonymous is all about one drunk sharing with another drunk. And there's one woman in this room. I don't know who you are, 
but somebody needed to hear something I had to say today. And if the rest of you wanted to fall asleep, that's fine. Because this is just an AA meeting with one drunk sharing with another drunk. I've uh, had a lot of opportunities to be uh, in service in the years that I've been sober. I had my first daughter when I was six years sober, and um, I don't get to as many meetings as I used to. And I sometimes get get for the judgmental look from people. And that's fine because I have my path to walk and you have yours. And I would love, you know, I mean, there are times when I've done H&I and I've done, you know, been on the diverter and I've, you know, I was an alternate GSR and I, you know, I did all that kind of stuff. And you know what, right now, the majority of my time is mommy, mommy time. I still get to meeting because it's vitally important that I am somewhere where I can interact with newcomers. Vitally important. An online meeting, a telephone call with somebody else is, in, is great for me. You know, but the altruism that this program is based on means that I need to be available to newcomers. When someone walks through the door, they need to know that they need to see somebody sitting there that's been sitting there, you know, that's been sober for 14 years. It's my responsibility to pass it on, and I know that. But I don't make the commit kind of commitments that I used to make, um, right, wrong, or indifferent. It's, I don't. And... um I am so incredibly honored to be asked to be here today and to be able to to be of service in some way because because it's important because God asked me to do this. You know, it's, again, you know, it's not my ego. Um, someone asked me, you know, you know, are you nervous? I've been asked that all day, you know, and are you have you thought about what you're going to say? And I'm like, you know what? They asked me to come here, so that means God thinks I have something to say. I, it doesn't matter what I think. So I'm going to show up and then do the thing, and there you go. Some alcoholic woman in, in, that's here needed to hear something that I said, and that's good enough for me. Looks like we're going to end the meeting early again. Because um, I just don't have anything to make up. <laughs> yes, Yesterday, um, Gail told me, she goes, we're going to be sitting there and make sure you tell the truth. And I was like, which version of the truth was that? I love Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new, I hope you get to stay. It's a lot easier to stay than it is to come back. Um, And I only say that because of my observation. I haven't had to do it. But I've seen a lot of people struggle with coming back. Alcoholic ego is a tremendous, tremendous thing and very powerful and will keep you out. Um, it's not easy to come back and say, I'm a newcomer again and stand up and ask for help because, you know, you know, I've been there. I've done that. And, uh, you know, and that's probably one of the reasons why I'm so proud of my ex-husband is that he's been able to do that and he's able to humble himself and that, you know, he gets to be alive and be there for his kids. And I'm just... I'm just eternally grateful to you guys for saving his life. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.